السلام عليكم بسم الله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله 
يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما indeed all praise is due to allah we praise him we rely on him and we seek his forgiveness and we seek allah's protection from the evils within ourselves and from our, from our wrong doings he whom allah guides no one can misguide and he whom Allah misguides, of course because of what, that he chose misguidance, then no one else get, can guide. And I bear witness that there is no God worthy of being worshipped except Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alone. Uh, sorry, and there, I, I believe that I bear witness that there is no God worthy of being worshipped except Allah alone without any partners and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and messenger. Indeed, amma ba'd fa anna khayr al-kalami kalam Allah wa khayr al-hadi hadi Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam wa sharra al-umuri muhdathatuha wa kulla muhdathatin bid'ah wa kulla bid'atin dalala wa kulla dalalatin fin nar Indeed, the best of words are Allah's words. The best of guidance is that of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. The worst of affairs in the religion are those innovated by people because every such innovator, uh, innovation is a misguidance that leads to the fire. So our discussion today is about how to raise our children in the time that we live in and in the environments that we live in in the basically in the western environments Allah Azza wa Jal gives birth to every human being while he is upon a pure nature that has not yet been blemished or marred by the problems and deviation that is that exists on earth the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam tells us kullu mawludin yuladu ala alfitra fa abawahu yuhawidanihi أو يمجسانه أو ينصرانه. Every human being is created upon the fitra, the pure nature, and then later on his parents turn him into a Jew or a Christian or a Magian, Majusi, some other religion that existed in uh, and maybe still exists to some degree in Persia. فأبوي أو دني وينصراني كلبه كلبه ما تتولد جمعا just like a بهيمة an animal a cattle it is it is born whole it has no cut parts no cut leg no cut ear or anything like that هل ترى بها من جدعا so this hadith this important hadith points out to two important matters. Well, it's the top, yani. first part. So this hadith points to two important matters. The first is that Every human being is born 
pure. So Allah Azza wa Jal makes us start with a blank page. It has no problems in it. It has no born sins in it. It has no enforced deviation by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's pure and clean. And the second thing that Allah points to is that the way a human being is raised is the way that he's going to be later on. So the raising of a human being, which includes the environment that he lives in, is what makes him, whether, whether a Christian or a Jew or some other religion, or else, or else, yani, one may wonder why the hadith does not say, فَأَبَوَاهُ يُسَلِّمَانِ For example, أَوْ يُمَجِّسَانِ أَوْ يُنَصِّرَانَ أَوْ يَهُودَانِ why, why Islam is not mentioned in this hadith? And the answer is that if a human being continues upon the path of Islam, is his, if his parents raise him according to Islam, then he stays in agreement with the way that Allah created him. So Allah created him pure, he will continue to be pure. But otherwise this happens. So this tells us that there is a great effect of environment and of upbringing on every human being. The Prophet ﷺ also tells us that the obligation of keeping the human being upon the pure nature with which he was born is falls upon the shoulders of the parents. So he says, كُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ رَعِيَّتِهِ each one of you is a rain, is a person, is, is someone who is charged with a responsibility, and everyone will be questioned about his responsibility. Imam Thus, the ruler, the ruler, the overall ruler of a nation, is rain, is charged with the responsibility of his nation, and will be questioned about his responsibility, and the father. And the man, وَالرَّجُلُ رَاعٍ فِي أَهْلِ بَيْتِهِ A man is also charged with the responsibility in regard to his household. وَهُوَ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ رَعِيَّةِ And Allah will question him about his ra'iyya, about his responsibility. How did he fulfill it? وَالْمَرْأَةُ رَاعِيَّةٌ فِي بَيْتِ زَوْجِهَا وَهِيَ مَسْؤُولَةٌ عَنْ رَعِيَّتِهَا And the woman, similarly, has a responsibility in her husband's house and she will be questioned about her responsibility. In some reports, it says that the woman is responsible in regard to her husband's property and child. Yani, in regard to raising the children in the household. And then the Prophet at the end of this hadith, he says, فَكُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ رَعِيَّةِ Thus, every one of you has a responsibility and he will be questioned about it. So we have a responsibility, there is no doubt about it, towards our children. We want them to stay upon the pure nature with which Allah created them. We have to work towards establishing that, and that requires a lot of work that we will be discussed, insha'Allah. Allah Azza wa Jal commands the believers in general, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَهْلِيكُمْ نَارًا وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارًا He tells us what is the charge that we have towards our families. Towards our families. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, qu anfusakum, all you who believe, protect yourselves, wa ahlikum and your families 
from a fire, yeah, the hell fire, وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةَ whose fuel is people and stones. عَلَيْهَا مَلَائِكَةٌ غِلَاظٌ شِدَادٌ لَا يَعْصُونَ اللَّهَ مَا أَمَرَهُمْ وَيَفْعَلُونَ مَا يُؤْمَرُونَ Upon it are appointed angels who are severe and huge or powerful. لَا يَعْصُونَ اللَّهَ مَا أَمَرَهُمْ They do not disobey Allah in whatever He commands them. Rather, they do as they are commanded. قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَهْلِيكُمْ نَارًا As Ibn Kathir, رحمه الله, in his tafsir, brings a lot of narrations from the Salaf, from Ibn Abbas and Ali رضي الله عنهما, and from many of the tabi'een, such as Qatada, رحمه الله, and others, indicating that قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَهْلِيكُمْ نَارًا Protect yourselves and your families from the fire, means teach them and raise, raise them upon Islam, upon the correct teachings of Islam and its good manners. So our obligation towards our families means we have to raise them according and upon Islam. Thus we understand from this, that, that having children is not in itself a pleasure that we enjoy for as much as we want and for as long as, as we have the children. And the more children we have, the more pleasure that we have because of them. No. The more children we have, the more responsibility we have. When we have children, then we have a responsibility. And Allah Azza wa Jal tells us in a number of the ayat of the Quran that we will be tried or we are tried by our children. For example, He subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ فِتْنَةً Indeed, your wealth and your children are a trial for you. إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ فِتْنَةً How could the wealth be a trial? Because, as, as Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَنَبْلُوكُمْ بِالشَّرِّ وَالْخَيْرِ فِتْنَةً we try you with what is good, with the ease, with sharfish, with evil, or with the hardship, well khairi, and with good things, with hardships and with good things, as a fitna, as a trial for you. So that when a person is tried with hardship, and he exhibits submission to Allah Azzawajal and acceptance of his will, then he will be rewarded for this. And when he is tried, tried with good, with ease of living, then he will be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, grateful to Allah. And this will be shown by his actions, not by mere words. So this is the double trial. The double trial of good and hardship, of ease and hardship. Similarly, إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ فِتْنَةً Your wealth is a fitna because Allah Azza wa Jal gives us wealth and then we are tried by this wealth. If we use it in what pleases Him, then we win or we succeed in such a trial. Otherwise, we would be losing and failing. Similarly with the children. إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ and in the other ayah, he says, وَعَلَمُوا أَنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ فِتْنَةً And know that your wealth and your children are a trial for you. Know well that they are a trial for you. So the children are a trial. How are they a trial? If we raise them well, if we raise them well, then Allah Azza wa Jal will reward us for that. If we 
raise them or are careless about raising them well, then we are not fulfilling our responsibility towards them and Allah Azza wa Jal would punish those who neglect to raise their children the right way. Now of course you notice also that a person may raise his children well and try his best and spend the best of his wealth to make them good Muslims but find that he is not successful in that find that he did not succeed okay so that is another source of fitna that is another kind of fitna that and it is in that case like somebody who is tried by what is beyond his ability our what is within our ability and capacity is to put the effort in regard to raising our children then after that after we have put the effort if we put the effort such that they will grow as good believers then alhamdulillah we have done our job Allah Azza wa Jal will reward us for this if we did not put the required effort then we cannot say they will be bad we say that if it is not for Allah's mercy and help they will be bad because sometimes people will neglect their children and still the children will grow up to be good Muslims so it is in Allah's hand the guidance is in Allah's hand but for us we will be responsible and if we neglect our trust our responsibility Allah Azza wa Jal will ask us will question us why didn't you raise your children the way that you were supposed to raise them now the other possibility as I was saying is that we we put the effort but the children do not end up being good when they grow up they grow into disobedient people individuals so in that case this is another kind of fitna for us this is another kind of fitna because and in that case Allah Azza will not say why didn't you raise your children but Allah will require from us in that case to submit to this calamity that we have which is the calamity of having bad children and submit to that show submiss submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by accepting his degree and making dua to Allah that he will guide them uh, at some point but this is something that's possible and it happened even to some prophets even to some prophets as Allah Azza wa Jal tells us about Nuh alayhi salam Nuh alayhi salam a prophet of Allah one of Ulul Azmi min al Rusul one of the best five prophets and messengers we do not expect that he neglected to raise his children according to Islam and yet his son one of his children the son who is mentioned in the Quran was an evil man did not accept the message of and the teachings of his father so Allah Azza wa Jal, wa Jal drowned him with those whom he drowned and Adam uh, Nuh sorry said yani addressing Allah Azza wa Jal قال ربي إن ابني من أهلي وإن وعدك الحق وأنت أحكم الحاكمين he said oh Allah oh my Lord my son is one of my family members and your promise is the truth because Allah promised that he will save him and his family from the flood so he said you pray you promise to, to save me and, and my family and here is a member of my family and I see him drowning but you are Ahkamul Hakimin, the most wise of the wise so see he did not object to Allah's decree he was just asking Allah for clarification 
Why was he drowned? And yet I submit to your decree whatever it is. So Allah said, قَالَ يَا نُوحُ إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ مِنْ أَهْلِكَ Oh Nuh, he is not one of your family. إِنَّهُ عَمَلٌ غَيْرُ صَالِحٍ فَلَا تَسْأَلْنِ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ أَلْمٍ إِنِّي عَيْضُكَ أَنْ تَكُونَ مِنَ الْجَاهِلِينَ Which means, oh Nuh, he is not of your family. He is a, an evil deed or he committed evil deeds. So he represents evil in his person. إنه عمل غير صالح أو إنه عمل غير صالح as in some narrations or in some of the قراءات of the ayah of the same ayah. So Allah Azza wa Jalla is informing Nuh here that he does not deserve to be considered one of your family because he was a disbeliever. So we see that it is possible that you put as much effort as you can and still the child that you love will not be according to what you want. Because guidance is in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not in our hands. إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ You indeed, you cannot guide whom you wish. Rather, Allah is the one who guides whomever He wills. So guidance is in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this applies to everyone that we make da'wah to, including our children. But then it doesn't mean that we stop making da'wah because we say that some people will not listen to us. We will put a lot of effort into da'wah toward them and they will not listen to us. So we we'd rather stay at home and spare ourselves the time and effort. We never say this, right? And the same, or even more so, we do regarding our children. We do not say we, are, we do not know how they are going to grow. Maybe they are grow, they'll grow righteous, maybe, maybe not. So let us not worry about raising them. And leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise them as he, as he wills. We cannot say that because as you heard, Allah azza wa jal made it a responsibility, an obligation upon us to raise our children the way that he wants us to raise them, the way that he taught us to raise them. Another hadith, another text that indicates how the children are a fitna for us is this hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-waladu majbanatun mabkhalatun What's the last word? Mahzana Al-waladu majbanatun Mabkhalatun mahzana. Majbanatun means when you have a child, you become cowardly. Yani whenever you do, you act, you always think about your children. I have to protect myself so that nothing happens to me for the sake of my children. Yani when a, when a person does not have children or is not married, he has more courage to do things to do yani, uh, dangerous acts. But when he has children, he becomes cowardly to some degree. Okay, that is, that means majbanatun. Mabkhalatun means he causes you to be stingy. Before marriage, you'll invite your friends and spend a lot of money on them and you know, you'd not care about money. But once you have children, then you start thinking, I need to spare, to save some money for them, for this, for that, for their education, and so on. So they lead to some level of stinginess. And mahzana, what does mahzana mean? It means they, they cause you sadness sometimes or often. Because they are often, and we see this a lot as the children 
uh, start growing that many times they are rebellious. They say, especially when they are adolescent, when they are in their teenage years, they do not listen to their parents. You tell them, uh, it is day, they say, no, it is night. It is night, no, it is day. They always oppose you. So this causes you some kind of unhappiness or displeasure. So they are a cause of sadness for their parents. And this is a general rule. Of course, it has exception, exceptions in those that Allah blessed, the children that Allah blessed. And they are always a source of happiness for their parents, whether they are babies or uh, teenagers or grown-up people. So may Allah Azawajal make all of our kids like this. Because we need that yani, for ourselves and for our ummah. But this tells us again that there is a trial involved in the children that we have. Uh, the children among, among the fitna in the children is that uh, what Allah Azawajal said that they are the adornment of the worldly life. But not every adornment is good for us. Sometimes, as we said, it could be good. Sometimes it could, could not be good. So Allah says, for example, Which means it has been adorned for people. The love of women, يعني, people here means men. Uh, the love of women, the, uh, the love of desires of women and children and other things that Allah Azza tells us of other things that people desire. And then and also Allah Azza says, Al Mal dunya wealth and children are the adornment of the worldly life. And he says, اعلموا أنما الحياة الدنيا زينة ولهو وتفاخر بينكم وتكاثر في الأموال والأولاد. So he t- he's telling us that know well that this worldly life is an adornment and play and يعني for most people it's like this. وتفا- وتك- وتفاخر بينكم يعني and boasting, people boast, I have so many kids, I have so much wealth, I have such big house, I have such nice car, and so on. So this is how people live in this life. They boast about their possessions and the things that they feel are sources of pleasure for them. So Allah includes in this, and you try to compete with others in regard to wealth and children. So this is how a human being is. He wants more children, he wants to be boastful about them, but when it comes to educating them and raising them correctly, he says, let someone else worry about it. I have done my job of bringing them into this life by, through marriage, and then I, I spend my wealth on them, and that's it, that's enough. So this is not enough, as we will see, inshallah. We have to remember that if we do not if we do not strive to raise our children according to the way that is pleasing to Allah Azza wa Jal and that would bring its good fruits to us, then our relationship with them will not continue to be good. And when they are little, our relationship with them is good. We love them, we kiss them, we hug them. They are our beloved closest beings to us, human beings to us. But as they grow, maybe even before we get to the next life, maybe in this life, they will become our enemies. They may become our enemies, as you heard in the case of Nuh alayhi salam, when his son became one of his enemies. And he stayed with the enemies whom Allah drowned. He said, oh my son, come, come be with us on the ark. 
and do not be with the disbelieving people. He said, no, 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 I don't want to. I will climb the top of a high mountain and nothing will happen to me. Okay, so he was an enemy to his father. Allah Azza wa tells us about the child whom Al-Khadr killed by Allah's command. He tells us that the child who was most likely a grown-up boy يعني in his teens. وَأَمَّا الْغُلَامُ فَكَانَ أَبَوَاهُ مُؤْمِنَيْنِ فَخَشِيْنَا أَنْ يُرْهِقَهُمَا طُغْيَانًا وَكُفْرًا As for the, for the boy, his parents were righteous and we were afraid that he will overburden them with his transgression and his disbelief. So Allah Azza wa knew that if he was to live long enough, if he were to live long enough, he would have caused a lot of uh, turmoil to his, to his parents. So Allah Azza wa decreed for him to die when he was still in the beginning of his life of deviation. And Allah tells us also about and as an example, in Surah Al, uh, Al uh, what is it? This is the last Surah of uh, Juz 25, uh, or the first Surah, sorry, of Juz 25, uh, about وَالَّذِي قَالَ لِوَالِدَيْهِ أُفِّلْ لَكُمَا الْأَحْقَافِ In Surah Al-Ahqaf. He tells us وَالَّذِي قَالَ لِوَالِدَيْهِ أُفِّلْ لَكُمَا أَتَعِدَانِنِي أَنْ أُخْرَجَ وَقَدْ خَلَتِ الْقُرُونُ مِنْ قَبْلِي وَهُمْ يَسْتَغِيثَانِ اللَّهَ وَيْلَكَ آمِنْ إِنَّ وَعْدَ اللَّهِ حَقٍّ فَيَقُولُ مَا هَذَا إِلَّا أَسَاطِيرُ الْأَوَّلِينَ الَّذِي قَالَ لِوَالِدَيْ A person, Allah tells us about a person who said to his uh, parents, Woe be to you, you keep telling me that there is hereafter, that Allah will punish me, that Allah will do this and that to me. You promise me, you keep telling me that I'll be resurrected. So this tells us that in this case his parents tried to raise him well, but subhanAllah, Allah willed for him to be deviant. And he says, and the other nations and other centuries before me, the, other, the previous generations have passed, and we never heard of something like what you are telling me about. And they called upon Allah, they invoke Allah to help them, to help them. And they say, وَيْلَكَ آمِنْ آمِنْ Woe be to you, believe, believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he keeps telling them, this is only but the fables of the ancient. So don't waste your time with me. So this is like the child of Nuh, same thing. Like the son of Nuh. So... What I'm saying is that the relationship between us and our children doesn't have to stay good in this life. But for those who exert the effort to raise their children well, and with Allah's help, most of the time, Allah will help them so that their children will indeed end up being good. If they neglect this, then their children will not be good and this will be a source of remorse, of regret for them in this life and also in the next life. Also in the next life. So do not expect the relationship to stay good unless you have worked on it to be good. As Allah Azza wa Jal says that about the next life, يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِيهِ On that day, when the person will be running away from his father, from his brother and father and mother, and his wife and children, because each one is concerned about his well-being. But then on the day of judgment, that is at the time of judgment. But later on, for the believers, Allah Azza wa Jal will grant them a favor that if they are believers and their children are believers, 
then he will let them and their children be together in the next life as they are in this life. Yani as they wish, at least in this life, even though they might, might not be together. So he says, uh, he says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَاتَّبَعَتْهُمْ ذُرِّيَّتُهُمْ بِإِيمَانٍ أَلْحَقْنَا بِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَمَا أَلَتْنَاهُمْ مِنْ عَمَلِهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ كُلُّ مْرِئِمْ بِمَا كَسَبَ رَهِينٍ which means those who believed and their progeny followed them into belief as well. Yani they were believers as well. We joined their families, their children, their descendants, their progeny with them on the Day of Judgment without making them lose any of their own deeds. Yani the ulama yani discuss this ayah, of course, and among what they tell us is that this means that and let's suppose that the parent was very righteous and the child was not as righteous as the parent. So Allah promises to join the children with the parents. Does this mean that Allah will lower the level of the parent so that he will be at the same level in Jannah as the children? And the answer is no. Without letting them lose any of their deeds, yani, they, or without being deprived from their deeds, yani, they will still get their high levels in Jannah, but in such a way that is not known to us in this life, Allah Azza wa will let them have their children near them. Okay, so this is one of Allah's favors upon the believers who have children that are believers as well. So, this tells us that a lot of the relationship that we have in this life with our children can be preserved for the next life if we work hard on raising them correctly. Otherwise, our relationship with them will be severed, will be cut, terminated. As Allah Azza wa Jal tells us, الْأَخِلَّاءُ يَوْمَئِذٍ بَعْضُهُمْ لِبَعْضٍ عَدُوٌّ إِلَّا الْمُتَّقِينَ الْأَخِلَّاءُ means the close friends. بَعْضُهُمْ لِبَعْضٍ عَدُوٌّ They'll be enemies to each other on the day of, of judgment or in the, in the next life. إِلَّا الْمُتَّقِينَ Except those who, are, who have taqwa. So if you want to stay أَخِلَّاء close friends with our children, with our offspring in the next life, then we have to work hard on implanting taqwa in their hearts. On implanting taqwa in their hearts. Okay? And that means that we have to raise them with taqwa upon taqwa. Yani we should have taqwa the way that we deal with them. We, sh we should have taqwa in our hearts the way that we bring up our children so that we can bring them up according to the teachings of Islam. And we have to raise them upon taqwa. Okay? So with taqwa and upon taqwa. We have to raise them so that they feel Allah Azza wa Jal and they understand His deen well. Yani it is not very important, though we usually neglect it. Most people, most parents neglect it. Most, pe most parents neglect the fact or the, the importance of raising their children upon taqwa, but they are very concerned that their children are raised so that they will be able to earn good money when they grow up. So everyone, his main concern that his child should be a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer or have some other good profession that will earn him money. Yani subhanallah, we center our thoughts upon the thing that Allah told us don't worry about it because he will provide for all people, for all his creation. He will not neglect anyone. 
and we forget the thing that is more important for them, which is to raise them upon taqwa. If they have taqwa, and they do not have a good profession in their hands, they will still survive, and they will still survive decently. And I've never seen a person with taqwa who is not decent in the way he is living. On the other hand, if they do not have taqwa, they will not be decent in this life, no matter how much wealth they collected. As Allah, as the Prophet وسلم, tells us, من كانت الدنيا همه من كانت الدنيا همه Trying to think grammatically which is more correct. من كانت همه الدنيا لا من كانت الدنيا همه من كانت الدنيا همه من كانت الدنيا همه فرق الله عليه شملة وجعل فقره بين عينيه وَلَمْ يَأْتِهِ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَا كُتِبَ لَهُ The one whose main concern is the worldly life, then Allah will sever his ties, will divide him off from his beloved ones. There will be no feelings of love and concern between him and the ones that he wishes to be loving towards him. فَرَّقَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ شَمْلَةً وَجَعَلَ فَقْرَهُ بَيْنَ عَيْنَيْهِ And he will place poverty between his eyes. يعني, even if he is wealthy, he will see poverty all the time, wherever he goes. وَجَعَلَ فَقْرَهُ بَيْنَ عَيْنَيْهِ وَلَمْ يَأْتِهِ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَا كُتِبَ لَهُ And he will, either way, he will not attain from this dunya except that which has been recorded for him. And he will not be able to be more wealthy than other people because Allah has prescribed how much he's going to earn in this life. وَلَمْ يَأْتِهِ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَا كُتِبَ لَهُ وَمَنْ كَانَتِ الْآخِرَةُ هَمَّةُ And as for the one who the next life is his main concern, يعني he has a, a far goal. His goal is not the goal of the short-sighted, only 10 centimeters away. He has a far goal, far but fixed and solid and well-determined goal. مَنْ كَانَتِ الْآخِرَةُ هَمَّةُ جَمَعَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ شَمْلَةً Allah will bring his ties together, okay, so that he will have feelings of love and mercy between him, himself, and his relatives, his friends, and so on. جمع الله عليه شملة وجعل غناه في قلبه and he will place self-sufficiency self into his heart. He will place content in his heart so that he will feel satisfied with what Allah has given him. وجعل غناه في قلبه وأتته الدنيا وهي راغمة and دنيا, this word of life will come to him despite itself. So he doesn't have to worry about the rizq that should come to him because it will come to him. He has made a good goal. Yani like when you are taught to drive, when you are first taught to drive, you are told, don't look right in front of the car, look far away. If you look right in front of the car, you'll make an accident. So let your goal be far off. And then you drive in that direction and the car will definitely be straight. And this is the one whose goal is the hereafter. His goal is far off and he knows that he is going in the right direction. Now that we have established to some degree the importance of raising our children and the obligation that we have of raising them according to the teachings of Islam, we look at some of the practices of the Prophet Muhammad in this regard. The Prophet Muhammad yani being the perfect human being, was perfect at all levels and in all respects. 
So in his da'wah, yani imagine, subhanallah, Aisha says that he used to be in his house working, serving his, his household. Sometimes sewing, patching his clothes. Imagine the leader of the ummah, the greatest leader of the ummah, he would be in his house working on some of the little things that need to be done within the house. But then when the time for prayer comes, he leaves everything and goes for the prayer. How did he have time to do this? Yeah, and now you find one of us has a limited job from eight to five. And we, when we come home, we tell our wife, we do not have time for anything. We are so tired. The Prophet ﷺ was leading the ummah. He was going into one battle after the other to establish Islam. He was teaching the people in the masjid the whole time, guiding them, receiving invoice from different tribes and different uh, leaders in Arabia and around it. He was doing so much for Islam and still he found some time for his family. For the children. Once he was giving a khutbah, he was standing on the member. Let's say this is, this is a member, right? So he was standing on the member, giving the khutbah. Imagine an imam of our time doing it. So he was standing on the member, giving the khutbah. Standing up here, let's say. Your coffee, let me not kick it. So he was giving the khutbah, addressing the people. And then he saw Hassan and Hussein coming. They were just, you know, little, very little boys about to fall. Yata'atharan. Yeah, little boys in the beginning of their walking about to fall. So he stopped his khutbah, went down from the member until he reached them and he hugged them to, so that they do not fall. And then he recited this ayah, Al-Mal wal banana Zinat al-Hayat al-Dunya. Wealth and children are of the adornment of the worldly life. So, yani imagine this man, subhanAllah, it's very hard to imagine. He would see a child on the street. And he would ask him, Ya Aba Umair, ma fa'ala nughayr? Oh Abu Umair, what happened to, the, to your little bird? Yani he saw him probably before with a little bird and then he doesn't see the bird with him. So what happened to your bird, to your birdie, this small bird that you had? Yani he did not neglect even the children, the babies. So, uh, uh, the, the son of Umm Salama radiallahu anha to, to, tells us that he was a little boy and he used to live in the household of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And his, he said, my hand used to go around the plate when I ate. So the Prophet ﷺ taught him a lesson. He said, Ya Ghulam, oh boy, Sammillah. When you start eating, first say, Bismillah. Wakul biyaminik, and eat with your right hand. Wakul min mayalik, and eat from your side of the plate. So what was the, resp the, what wa what, what was the effect of this on the boy? He said, فَمَا زَالَتْ تِلْكَ طَعْمَتِي بَعْدُ So from that time on, this was the way I always ate. So the Prophet ﷺ, the busy leader of the Ummah, found time to teach the child something that remained in him, with him all his life. And not only that, that he taught it to us to the whole ummah, to all generations of Muslims until the end of time. And there are numerous examples from the Sunnah to show us how the Prophet ﷺ took care of raising the children. Yani he did all of this in a way that you find it a natural way. Nothing artificial. Yani sometimes we say, okay, now I am gonna give a talk and address the young generation. Now I'm going to give a talk for the adults. For him, he, there were no artificial borders. 
When there was chance to deal with the kids, he dealt with them naturally. When there was chance to deal with the adults, he dealt with them. When there was, there was chance and need to deal with the extremely ignorant people, he dealt with them at the level that they understand. Like when a Bedouin came and he entered the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. And from the door, you know, let's say the Prophet ﷺ standing where I am now. And the door is at the door like the door where, of this hall. So the Bedouin stood at the door and he said, Ya Muhammad. Yani yelling out his name. And this is very impolite. Allah Azza wa Jal told the Sahaba to lower their voice when they are talking to the Prophet ﷺ. But this is a, an ignorant Bedouin. So what was the response of the Prophet ﷺ? He said, Haum. And here I am. And just the way, with the, with the level of voice, similar to the voice level of the man who was talking at the door. And to show him that, you, you, you can feel comfortable that I am similar to you. Our ways are like your ways. Okay? So the Prophet ﷺ knew how to deal, as I said, naturally with people at all levels, and including children. He knew how to raise them so that they became the warriors and the teachers of the Ummah. The warriors and the teachers of the Ummah. As we are told about the two brothers. I forgot one of their names, but one of them was named Muaz, and the other a name close to that. They were young boys in their early teens and they wanted to fight with the Prophet ﷺ. They wanted to show themselves that they are old enough to, sh to fight. And the Prophet ﷺ would not allow anybody to fight unless he is you know, at the age of puberty. But they would stand on the tips of their toes to pretend they are taller so that the Prophet ﷺ would pass them. But he wouldn't pass them. But the next time, the next battle, which was, I believe, the battle of Badr, he passed them. So, so they, they fought like lions, and they, killed, they were killed in that battle. But after killing some of the worst enemies of Islam, and, uh, and that is recorded, you know, they are recorded as having, uh, in the Sunnah, until the end of time as being some of the heroes, some of the eternal heroes of Islam. Uh, on one occasion, Ibn Abbas radiallahu an was sitting behind the Prophet sallallahu on his horse or his camel. He said, Kuntu radifa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa took this occasion that he has a young boy behind him and Ibn Abbas, when the Prophet ﷺ died, he was not even in his teens yet. He was probably 10 plus or minus a year. Yani. He was quite young. And yet, the Prophet ﷺ did not miss the chance that he has a young boy behind him to teach him some important lesson. So he said, Ya Ghulam, Inni u'allimuka kalimat. Oh, young boy, I will teach you a few words. Ihfadillaha yahfadk. Safeguard Allah. Yani the limits of Allah. And Allah will protect you. Ihfadillaha tajidhu tujahak aw amamak. Safeguard Allah and you will find him in front of you. Yani if you obey Allah and live by his commands, when you need him, he will be in front of you to help you. إِحْفَظِ اللَّهَ تَجِدُهُ تُجَاهَكَ إِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهُ When you ask, ask Allah. وَإِذَا اسْتَعَذْتَ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهُ And if you seek protection, seek protection from Allah. وَعَلَمْ أَنَّ الْأُمَّةَ لَوْ اجْتَمَعَتْ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَنْفَعُوكَ لَمْ يَنْفَعُوكَ إِلَّا بِشَيْءٍ قَدْ كَتَبَهُ اللَّهُ لَكَ And no. That if the whole Ummah, yani all people get together to try to benefit you with something, 
they will not benefit you except with that which Allah has ordained for you. And if they all get together to harm you, they will not be able to harm you except with something that Allah has ordained for you. رُفِعَةِ الْأَقْلَامُ وَجَفَّةِ الصُّحُفِ So you see, this is an important lesson. Yani this is not a little lesson. This actually a lesson that comprises the belief, the beliefs of Muslims. The aqidah of Muslims. If a Muslim understands this lesson that, Allah, that Allah's Messenger taught to Ibn Abbas while he was behind him on the camel, he would understand all the Islamic faith in simple terms. And yet, as we said, that was a young boy that the Prophet ﷺ did not neglect. For us, for example, For us people, yani normal people, if we have a little spare time with our kids, what do we do? We maybe spend it telling them funny stories and we basically waste the time. We do not try to yani, give them any benefit or yani, rarely would, would we give them a benefit that will last for them the rest of their life. Okay, uh, one last thing I want to say in this regard is that the Prophet ﷺ told us that when we, after we die, our deeds will end, will stop, will cease. Except for three things, sadaqatin jariyah, an ongoing charity, وَعِلْمٍ يُنْتَفَعُ بِهِ and knowledge that benefits people after him, and a good, good offspring that make dua for him. Good offspring that make dua for him. So if we want for our deeds to continue after we die, then we need again, as I said in the beginning, to strive hard to leave behind us good children so that they would make dua for us because that will continue to benefit us after our death, rather than leaving children who will curse their parents for not taking care of them in their childhood and for not teaching them the correct Islam, or for putting them in situations where they had to be disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa Now, uh, the, uh, yani the, in, mo in our modern time, so that we can talk about the rest of the title of the lecture, Raising Our Children in Modern Times. Now we probably understand that we have an obligation towards our children. That's probably the main point that I covered so far. And then uh, maybe another point that I covered to some degree is that we need to benefit from all the possible time that we have to uh, guide them and that we should not also, that we should not yani make any goal in their regard more important than this goal. Because all other goals are less important than this. Now, in regard to this, that part of the title, which is in modern time, what is different in modern times? The difference that in our times, in our modern times, yani we used to go we used to go, as I was telling some brothers, I think yesterday it was, that in our life, we are always swimming against the current. The river is going down, and we are swimming up the current. Okay? So we are always fighting the current so that we save ourselves. And the current is the temptations and the misguidance that is present in the world. So what is the difference between old times and modern times? In old times, when a person wants to raise his children, there, is this, there are distractions, there are external influences, but they are very limited. They are very limited, or they were very limited. In our time, the distractions, the external influ influences, are almost beyond control. 
are almost beyond control. And that is because of the explosive nature that we see of media, TVs, and uh, internet, newspapers, magazines, books, etc. So, so this makes our job harder, of course. So instead of swimming against the current in the river, we are swimming also in the river when it is coming downhill and we want to go uphill. So it's a much harder swim. There is much more effort required. Much more effort required. And how to deal with this? The harder the harder the situation is, the more that we need collaboration. That Muslims need the help of other Muslims. And as the Prophet ﷺ said, يَدُ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْجَمَاعَةِ وَإِنَّمَا يَأْكُلُ الذِّئْبُ مِنَ الْغَنَمِ الْقَاسِيَةِ Which means that Allah's hand is over the jama'ah. Allah's hand, yani Allah's protection is over the jama'ah and guidance over the, is over the jama'ah or part of the meaning that Allah's protection and guidance is over the jama'ah over the people who work as a jama'ah and indeed the wolf doesn't eat except from the scattered cattle, cattle. so if we are by ourselves one individual, two individuals we find that we are attacked by the wolf, by Satan and its, his allies, much more than if we are with the jama'ah. So we have to stay with the jama'ah. We have to stay with good, with good people, in a good company, in, in, with good company, so that, as we were discussing, I believe, yesterday, that, in the lecture of last night, that, uh, a person will be upon the religion of his close friend. So see whom you take as your close friend, or whom you give to your son and your daughter as close friends. Be careful and watchful over what they do and how they spend their time. What they do with their time and how they spend it. How much time they spend on the TV and as I was also discussing yesterday and now a lot of what we are saying today was covered also yesterday. Yani on the average, the American children and I'm sure this is the same or similar to it all around the world, maybe in some cases it's much worse. The American children spend at least five hours, four hours every day at least on the average, in front of the TV. And in many cases, this goes up to about six hours. So six hours, let's say they sleep eight hours, that means one, one third of their day is spent in front of the TV. And what does the TV do? It gives them, as I was saying yesterday, negative for a negative form of knowledge or a negative and passive form of knowledge so if it is it is either bad which is probably 50 percent of the time is bad and the other 50 per per percent of the time it is passive there is no interaction they are sitting and receiving the knowledge without having a chance to discuss it and argue with it so this is not the kind of knowledge that will stay with them and that is why you find that children who spend more time in front of the TV are less intelligent than children who do not have TV or whose parents that do not allow them more than one hour a day on the TV. And there is a lot of studies on this. You can find them on the internet. If you want to, to search for yourself, go and look on Google, say, children and TV or effect of TV on children. And you see how much harm it brings into the lives of our children. They say if, cho if toddlers or children under three years 
start spending a few hours every day on the TV, they will end up, they will stand a good chance of being retarded when they grow up. Even if before that they show signs of intelligence. Yani let us stop making the TV a babysitter for our children. It is the, the worst babysitter possible. Okay, so in order, and also we want to limit the outside influence of, on our children. So they, are, they go to school, and if it is not a well-controlled Islamic school, which is the, yani the exception for our children, the majority they go to public schools and other private schools, so they learn a lot of stuff that is of no benefit, rather of harm to them. If when they come home, we continue that trend by letting them stay on the TV, in front of the TV, then we are killing our children. We are killing the, those sprouts that we most care about. So, our job is actually, if we have to send them to, to public schools, our job is, Jazakallah, is when they come home, to wipe out a lot of what they learned in school. Yani keep what is good and remove, erase what is wrong. Not enforce what they learned, everything, every bit of it, and even more, teach them aggression, aggression teach them crime on the TV, teach them uh, uh, illicit sex on the TV when they are, you know, uh, still under age, they already see situations that even the adults will be harmed by seeing them. Internet is another wrong source of knowledge unless it is strongly controlled. Unless it is strongly controlled. And our children, when they go on the internet, they spend most of the time there chatting. And this leads them into a lot of harm, a lot of wrong relationship with other individuals, either from their own gender or from the other gender. And again, the internet is a, is a bad source, usually, of seeking knowledge, except for those who are knowledgeable enough to discern between what is good and what is bad. And our children are not usually to that level. So we talked about TV, internet, companionship. We need to keep our children in the company of good Muslims as much, as long as is possible. And if we can afford to have them in Islamic school, then also this is an obligation. We need to spend a lot of time with them at home. As I said, the Prophet Sallallahu who was the most, the busiest man who had the right to be, who had the right to be the busiest man in the Ummah, he did not neglect his children and the children of the Ummah to teach them and guide them. So how about us? When we have limited responsibilities in this life, so let us spend more time with our children. Let it not be that when we come home, we collapse, on the couch in front of the TV and have our dinner served to us on the TV, in front of the TV, and as they say, become what they call them, couch potatoes or something like that. So uh, let's avoid that. Let's not have the TV on while we are at home. Yani, by Allah, if you are, st if you are with your child at home, and you say, bring me a book, Riyad al-Salihin, for example. Let us read one hadith from it tonight and try to understand it together. You would be doing, you would be rendering yourself and your child a great service by this that he will remember for you even after you, after you die. Yani I remember situations that are very limited. When my father told me to do such and such a thing, which was yani, an Islamic act in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I still remember it. Whenever I remember that, I make dua for him 
a special dua for him for that, in addition, of course, to the general dua that you make for your parents. So do not neglect these little things. Do not say, what would a hadith make? What difference would it make? It will make a great difference. One hadith will make a great difference. Uh, Umar bin Abi Salama, as you heard, he learned a hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu three sentences, three short sentences, he remembered it all his life and he taught, us, taught it to us and to the whole Ummah afterwards. So these are some guidelines in regard to raising our children in modern time in the proper way. May Allah Azawajal guide me and you to fulfill this in the best way. هذا وصلى الله على محمد وعلى صحبه أجمعين